Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to this evening's conversation. So thankful that all of you are engaging in this truth and healing movement of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and taking the time to join us to do some listening and some learning and for the sake of hopefully some healing for all of us. So really excited that all of you have been able to join us. Um, some of you I see um, are folks who've been with us for other events this year already and, and some of you are new. So again, thank you all for taking the time to be here, whether you're a past participant or a new one for this evening. This evening, I have the pleasure and the privilege of getting to have a conversation with um, someone who is near and dear to my heart. Um, he is um, whom I consider one of my, or consider my, I should say, Omaha grandpas, I call him Papa George. We've known each other for a while doing this Indian boarding school work across the miles and uh, across across the, 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 the Indian country and, and quite frankly, in different parts of the church. And so just really thankful that um, George is willing to be with us and to share some of his experience as a boarding school survivor this evening. It's important for me to say that um, when having conversation with survivors, um, um, it's sometimes it's very hard to um, get a full story from folks um, because a lot of survivors don't want to have the conversations about their experience at boarding schools. Um, George has done a lot of healing work for himself and with other people. And so it's quite um, a gift that George is willing to be here to share a bit of his story um, as a boarding school survivor um, and a little bit about his life presently. So we just want to say thank you for that. Never assume that a Native person wants to share their story with you um, as you engage with folks who might be survivors or descendants of boarding school. Uh, that's not your privilege to have. And so that's why this is such a special moment for us today. Just want to say also that um, I've gotten to work with George in a variety of places in a variety of ways. And you can read his full bio um, or more full bio on the webpage, elca.org slash truth and healing. And um, you can see a little more about him there. But what I'd like to do is just introduce George in the beginning of our conversation and let him tell us a little bit about himself. If you're okay with that, Papa Georges, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what keeps you busy these days? Thank you, grandson. It is an honor to be here this evening, and I say thank you and appreciate everybody that's here listening on to um, what we're going to be, what I'm going to be sharing. And it's, um, I'm really honored and written, and know it's very important for us as Native people for to finally get our stories heard. And we know that boarding school has, boarding schools has, has a huge um, impact on indigenous people all across Turtle Island. Because wherever we go, wherever we know all our relatives, our grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, <clears throat> nieces and nephews, and even some of our, like myself, are and have been impacted <clears throat> with boarding schools. So it's touched all of us here in the indigenous land. And so it's a, it's a very important thing that we talk about it so the healing can begin of what happened. And you, to begin with that is, is hearing the truth. The truth can't be changed, the truth can't be denied and it can't be ignored. So I'm thankful and grateful that you're all here to listen in, to uh, know that things good can come from this. So, Umaha Nashinga, Uda Lati, Umaha Ijaja Bawite Makush, Umaha Bawite in case of a Wahe. Wawite, George McCulley. I'm come from the Omaha Nation in Mason, Nebraska. And as they always tell us, we always should introduce ourselves in our native, in our original language, because we never know when we're going to run into relatives wherever we travel. And they know that what, where you come from. And I said, I come from the Buffalo clan. That is one of the seven clans of the Omaha Nation. And even the people from that clan are relatives. So I come from the Buffalo clan and wherever you go, you may surprisingly run into somebody that is from your nation and 
it's always a um, good feeling when you know that you can share this, share this kind of greeting with everybody. And being on the reservation in the 1950s, my grandmothers only spoke the Omaha language. And I recall being around them and listening to them, all the relatives. But today, <clears throat> 50, 60, 70 years later, we have very few language speakers left. Maybe at this point, three to five, maybe less than that. So it is an honor to try to remember and carry on the language to share with my grandchildren and great grandchildren. Indeed, important stuff. And thank you so much for that um, that reminder and the importance of language in our in 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 our cultures and in our tribal nations. So thank you for sharing that. Um, can you, um, as this is a conversation about, um, of course, Indian boarding schools and um, maybe experiences around um, survivors um, such as yours, can you, would you, can you tell us about your boarding school experience? Where did you go? How did you find yourself at Indian boarding school? And what was it like for you there? When I graduated from the eighth grade <clears throat> in Macy, Nebraska, it's where the, um, our tribal land is that our school didn't have a high school. And the closest one was eight miles away, which is Wald Hill, Nebraska, and it was all white. And I had I had um very a lot of fear of white people, so I, I have no desire to go there. And I heard of Flandreau, a lot of my relatives and friends from the reservation had been to Flandreau, a lot of cousins and um people that were older than me. And I said, well, that's a lot of Indians there. And uh, we are a lot of different, even my relatives. So that's where I decided to go. And I really um, wasn't aware of all the abuse that, that's going on in boarding schools at the time. But Flandreau was not, um, had. if it had been that way, it was no longer like that. Like that. So it was um, uh, in Flanju, South Dakota, and they had tribes, kids from different tribes from all over the upper Midwest, from North South Dakota, uh, Montana, Wyoming, Minnesota, and Nebraska, and Iowa. 400 boys in a boys' dorm and 400 girls in a girls' dorm. So 800 students totally for um, for the school year and for every, I was there for four years. And the thing that, <clears throat> that um, for us, most of the people that I know that went there always said that, well, it wasn't bad. And when you think about not bad, you take that in a different context because there was the different abuses that, the horrendous abuses that happened in other schools wasn't happening in Flanjou. Yet it was still happening in other boarding schools, like in um, Rosebud, South Dakota, where my brother-in-law went to boarding school, and they were still physically abused, and, and um, we didn't luckily have to go through that. But what the biggest thing that for us was the neglect, the educational neglect, and um, not really uh, being around people that really cared about our um, how we were. Mm. Yeah. And and presumably everyone may have received that differently, as you said. Some yeah. like it's not bad. Um, it wasn't that bad. Um it was probably positive compared to other places that they knew about or um but their maybe parents or grandparents experienced in boarding school before them. And um and so you're right to to make that make that point. And so it's important for us to 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 also remember that you know, not bad means a lot of things. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you said, you know, there was a maybe some neglect or that there was neglect around, uh, you know, education, no education. well-being possibly. Um, but generally, what was your school experience like? Like um, you were there, I guess, since from the ninth grade. Um, and what did you, um, what was that like generally? Well, when you're 15, 14 years old, and um, 
I guess I was, uh, for me, it, school was easy. Uh -huh. And all the way through grade school, I wasn't challenged much. You know, uh -huh. Maybe it's being a part of the reservation. So I didn't have to work hard. I didn't have to, um, they didn't push me. Um, so when I got to Flange, it was the same thing. I mean, every class was easy. I had nothing to, to really uh, move me to another level. So the first sophomore and freshman years, I really loved math. So I took algebra one and two, and then the counselor said, well, you have your credits you need to graduate, so you don't need to take any more math courses. And I said, wow, you know, it's, that would be fun because I won't have to do much. So the whole four years was, was like that. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that I took was it was not hard, and the teachers weren't very trying to get you to learn stuff. And I think that's what I don't know why they they um, have us go to school because they weren't there to try to get us into college. They weren't trying to get us to do to be uh, educated. It seemed like they just wanted to get you high, graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. And then push you into a trade school. And back then, you know, it wasn't it was good as it is now to be in a trade school. And the other thing is we had to march. We, in, in a gym class, man, that's all we did was march every day. And we woke up to bells. We had, you know, just like the military, I guess. I haven't been in the military, but our beds had to be made really completely perfect all our shoes had to be tucked under the bed everything put away the floor swept and mopped and um, so for four years and the blurring intercoms saying when we had to go to bed when we had to get up and <clears throat> that is the only thing that I, I remember uh, how boarding school was mm -hmm. so it wasn't military but it certainly was modeled after military like a lot of other boarding schools were that's what I under, understood and have learned about. Like, that's the first thing they did because it, it was started by the first boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, was by a, on a military military base and run by a, a military officer. So, yeah, that was that was a plan. And when I talk about the, um, we all hung together, like from the, the, the kids from my reservation, we... We hung out together, and every group hung out together. And the Crow Indians, they were a group, and so we all kind of stuck together, and that's how we had got our support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, extended family, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I know looking back over the years, I'm curious to know how might have um, attending an Indian boarding school, Indian boarding school impacted your life as an adult? How, was, how did that um, direct um, your life as an adult, do you think, if any way? When we talk about, you know, the trauma we experience, and just until recently, I've started learning about it, and I think it's just kind of come out just recently about all the trauma that um, as indigenous people we have been through and it seems to be fairly new. And the thing that impacted me the most is when I was in um, 11th grade, I was, <clears throat> I remember one morning um, was in class that was an English class is that uh, started at 11 o'clock. I could still see the little speaker and clock on the wall and heard the secretary, school secretary voice come over the speaker and said, if you could have George McCauley report to the office. And so <clears throat> it was right below, I was on the second floor, I went down to the main floor and she gave me a little slip, a little pink slip that allows us to go back to the dorm. You can't go back to the dorms unless you have a slip. So I um, walked out of the school, was heading to the dorm, and I kept thinking, man, I wonder what I did. 
because you know I was kind of thinking really hard. What I do? And I, and I missed my bed up. There's something around the room or what? But when I got into the dorm, uh, my room was way up close to the office. And as I walked, I walked to the to the <clears throat> dorm room. There's four of us in the room, and I know they could see me coming. They had the mirrors. You can see down the hallway. As I didn't go to the office, I just went to the room and sat down, laid down my bed, and waited for them to come down and let me know what I did. So the super the supervisor of the dorm staff came down and he came in a room and he said, I got some bad news to tell you that your mom passed away last night. Yeah. And man, that was just a um such a numb feeling and I can remember it everything exactly to this day and then he said um, we're working on a bus ticket to get you home. Mm. And that was yep. take your time. So we just left it there long in that sense. And I think about how they just left you there, you know, not really I don't know how it felt. And that was the biggest impact that for me that I didn't know um, what abandonment issues were. And it took me 50 years to finally realize that, man, that had a huge impact on me. Mm -hmm. and, and it would, you know, I like that really getting married and being with someone who um, is very nurturing. And I finally figured out that's what it was. And I was, I was really pissed because, you know, so many relationships that I had been in that, that didn't work. And I kept thinking, man, what is going on here? I can't make this, they never last. And every time maybe somebody I was involved with really cared for me, I would run. Mm -hmm. But my wife and I have been married 20 years now and it was just um, on the 11th. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that she stuck with me and was able to um, know what I needed. I mean, that was, that was um, work of the creator. Yeah. How it put us together. And, and I, I, I think about that and how that um, so many of us had those kind of things that happened in school, but we never talked about them. I know a lot of them. That's why a lot of people that have been to boarding school and you hear the story all the time, how they don't want to share what happened to them. But if they don't talk about it, if they don't get it out, you know, it's going to be passed on to our future generations, to our children, our grandchildren. So I think it's really important to, to get our elders, the ones who are still uh, have not shared much about what happened to them, to somehow nurture them to get the information to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the uh, it's difficult, as we know, for folks to share, right? I mean, it's difficult for you to share some of this. And so again, we're grateful that you're open and willing to help us learn and to listen to you. Um, but there's a lot of folks out there, as you said, who has who haven't ever shared. Um, I think about, you know, my ancestors, my grandmas and my aunties who don't talk about boarding school. So as much as I tried to ask the questions, they just weren't willing to do that, right? And so they lived with a lot of frustration, angst, and a little bit of anger um, a lot of times, and um, which kind of leads me to my next question. Um, in your experience of being around other um, survivors, boarding school survivors, um, do you think that your experience um, was different in many ways from other survivors from other schools? What have you learned over the years? 
without being yeah, too. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, um, when we go back to my wife's um, homeland in Rosebud, South Dakota, um, we go visit her brother and we always um, talk about things and until just a couple years ago, about five years ago, he finally shared his experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that's the first time. I'm pretty sure it was. But he talked about all the abuse that, that they experienced in the school on the Rosebud Reservation. And I know that's an extreme from, from what I went through and from, from Flandreau to Stefan to Wapaton to um, Catholic um, school in Winnebago, Nebraska, and every one of them had a different kind of experience. Some were really bad, and some were like mine was, um, you know, I would say that we didn't bother them that much. But once you share the, with the kids that you went to school with, it starts coming back. Mm -hmm. Some are that. They had, a, they had an all-school reunion at the Flandreau Indian School, and I was looking forward to it, but I was scared. I didn't know what was going to go on. You know, I, I'm glad my wife was with me. And the sad thing is only about 10 people showed up, mm -hmm. but nobody from my class came. But what was really, really um, good for me is they opened up the dorms. So we could go in there and, and see, they open up the school, we can walk down the hallways and the lockers that we had. And But to go into the room where I went to when, when they told me the news about my mother, it was, I don't know, I didn't feel, I didn't feel anger. I didn't feel sad. I just kind of, wow. So to me that, that shows I hopefully think that, you know, I've done some healing. I've moved on about that. So I wish all our kids are the ones that been to boarding school were able to experience that one day. And mm -hmm. so I know it's a different, um, it's not the same for everybody. And I know our boarding schools are all over the United States and Canada. And so it's, um, yeah, a different experience for everybody. Yeah, indeed. And I just want to interject something, if I might, Papa. I want to just remind um, those of us, those who have joined us, that um, certainly we're we you we've just you've just shared and I've asked a question about the different types of experiences, and we won't go into too much detail here tonight, likely. Um, but one of the things that we often forget is it's not just about how badly the abuse was, but it was also um, the family separation, right? The need for you to be at a different school where any people were gathered and the education for Indian people on, in our communities was not provided at levels that were um, necessary for us to succeed. If there was a school at all, like you said, you got to eighth grade and there wasn't a school for you that wasn't white. Um, and then in addition to that, um, if you did go to the white school, there certainly wasn't any Indian education, but if you went to boarding school, there was no Indian education. Uh, and then also, the um, it's important to, for us to all remember that um, in addition to the separation, that um, we were being forced to learn to be white men, or like white people. It was a white education. It didn't take into any, I mean, it took us out of our communities from the very beginning of the boarding school era, even way back in the 1820s till the 1970s or until the 1960s. Um, it was taking us out of our communities and, and, and providing something that wasn't natural or, or indigenous. Uh, and so just want to make sure that those who are gathered recognize it isn't just the conversation can't just be about the abuse, though that's a very tragic part of the story and a very important part of the story. Um, it's about the separation from our culture and separation from who we are as indigenous peoples through European, um, Western Europe, Western education. So I just want to put that in there because I think a lot of folks um, think that um, the conversation is only about abuse, um, but the separation is abuse as well. Yeah, I know they talk about, uh, you know, in the beginning, to kill the Indian and save the man, and that was always been there 
uh, goal in life. And I forgot to mention that we had to get haircuts. Our hair was cut. We couldn't wear it over our collar more than an um, inch. So all the way through high school and now there's uh, haircuts. And when I graduated in 1971 and that school year was the last time I got a haircut. So mm -hmm. something I'm, you know, they didn't, I see that as, you know, they never did, they never did and never will kill the ending that who I am. But they did manage to succeed in different ways. Like when I graduated from high school, I never went back home. Mm -hmm. um, I came to Minneapolis and that's where I've been ever since. And the other part is the, the language, the stories. I know that I realized that recently too, that I never shared that with my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I know George's family um, and they're just cute. All of them are just cute and wonderful. And I've gotten to be a part of uh, bits and pieces of their lives too. So that's a really privilege, a really big privilege for me too. So thank you for sharing those folks with us, George. Yeah. Um, so um, the next question is always one that I think, um, I, quite frankly, I'm, I'm always curious about having grown up in the church myself, right? Um, with very little option um, because our family had been um, assimilated and, and missionized and Christianized um, for a couple of centuries, right? My family. Um, but I'm curious to know um, if attending Indian boarding school affected your faith or ceremonial life um, and um, how or how or not. And do you attend ceremony or church today um, due to boarding school at all? I don't know if that's really has, has um, I still haven't made that connection with boarding school. Maybe it has, and uh, maybe I got a little more healing to do. But when I left the school, and like I said, I came to Minneapolis, and I just knew that whatever um, we as Indian people lived in our ceremonies, I, I became part of. I went to sweat lodges and different ceremonies, uh, traveled with different uh, spiritual leaders. But when um, my wife and I moved here, she came to live with me and we just, we, we just, we support every way of um, how people believe. It's not the people, it's not the church, it's the people in the, who are running that, you know, people I have difficulty with. So, but we, we, uh, I would say that we always part, like my wife is from um, Rosebud and they follow the pipe, the Lakota way, ceremonies and sweat lodges. So that is our main one that we are part of. My, my people, the Omaha people follow the uh, Native American church, Peyote. My uncle is, is uncles are really part of that. And anytime something goes on, something important or something like when a relative dies, like um, he, he sometimes he'll ask me to come back to um, to uh, be part of that or just be around it during the um, ceremony or the um, funeral. We also, <clears throat> my grandchildren, um, their grandmother, follows the Madei way, the mm -hmm. Anishinaabe way of life, and they're a very big part of that. And we go and support that whenever we can. They have ceremonies four times a year, and different ones during days, just like the Sundance. And then we got it, um, Marlene, bless her heart, you know, we really miss her. We, um, she became close with my wife, and, and we all, but how I, been to All Nations Church a few times prior to Sandy becoming more involved in the church. And so we also believe in that. I mean, it's a, we go there during Christmas or any other activities. And the last and, and um, uh, that we really support is um, our grandchildren. My grandchildren's father is from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I know they follow Christianity. So we tell them to... Uh, Anyway, you want to be involved with any of these, you know, you're welcome to choose. You can be part of all of them. And we choose to be part of all of them. And we 
support what we can. And so um, we're happy with that. Yeah, great. I love that answer. Thank you for letting me ask that question. And the Marlene that George is mentioning here is the late Reverend Marlene Wright Rabbit Helgamo that some of you um, in the uh, um, who are here with us might know um, from as a pastor at All Nations Indian Church in Minneapolis, who was one of my church moms and adopted Ho Chunk mom, and um, and we certainly miss her. Um, but I have lots of stories from both George and Sandy, his wife, and Marlene about the times Marlene would call George and say, George, I need you to do something for me. And so I felt similar when I called him to do this conversation. <laughs> I'm going to call and say, George, I need you to do something for me. And so, because um, she was famous for getting us to do all the things, right? So I'm glad. Yeah, I want to share one, share one story that you just, I thought I heard somebody. No, go ahead. Like what you said about Marlene calling and ask, because she does that to everybody, and I get them to do something, and I always have them do something. And and I was at a Powell in Wisconsin one time, get my grandsons there, and I was walking back to our car because it started to rain, and there's a huge cars parked, you know, a huge lane between cars parking. And I was between one of them and my phone rang. And I I was carrying some food and coffee and I pulled it out of my pocket and looked at it and I seen it was Marlene that was calling. I thought, oh, I wonder what she wants. So I'm not in Minneapolis, so I won't answer. So I put it back in my pocket and got in my car to get out of the rain and drink my coffee. And she left a message. She said, what are you doing at the power? I just see you walked in the parking lot. And I, I was just, man, oh no, she saw me. I'm going to hell now because <laughs> she don't want to say no, not answer her call. That's true. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got away with that one. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, and George um, and Sandy um, have come to All Nations Indian Church, and I'm honored to say to hear me preach uh, a few times and to be present with me while I was there. And so always grateful for that. Um, All Nations Indian Church is a UCC congregation, but we consider it also a Lutheran ministry in our partnership with UCC um, through the Minneapolis area centered in my office. So just for those of you who are listening today. So George, um, couple more questions and from me, and I'm, I'm going to let folks know today that we won't be taking any um, questions from our participants today. Um, so I um, won't even apologize for that, but just George and I um, have agreed on some questions, except for this one I'm going to ask him. And, uh, um, and it's always a safer moment um, in situations where we're in, um, engaging with survivors to, to to help them prepare and to ready them for what to expect in these conversations. And so um, just want to let you folks know that. But the question I have is, you know, I've got to read your, your bio again. And um, you have done a lot of things to help other people in their healing journeys. I, I would love for you to share a little bit about the work that you've done um, um, in, in recent years, in the last couple of decades to help people heal. And even some of the work that you may have done with Sandy recently. Yeah, it's like you said, you know, when I came to Minneapolis in 1971 of December, um, I didn't really have any, like people say, what do you want to do in five years? I have no idea. I didn't care. Um, because of what I've been experienced with my education, you know, I just didn't have, didn't have, the, I guess they said, like I was treading water, you know, I just wouldn't do much. And for years and years, all I did was um, got a job and uh, played softball, um, gambled every weekend. And that was my whole life for like, man, almost 20 years. And then when <clears throat> uh, we got married, my wife moved to Minneapolis, that's when things seemed to finally come together as, as learning how to heal, learning how to know what's going on. And, and the recently, just the last 
10 years, all the amazing things that I've been able to do. Like, you know, I, I, I retired from where I used to work and then the Indian Child Welfare, um, I didn't retire by choice. They're supposed to go back to go back to work, but the funding didn't come through. And so I said, okay, well, I'm 60, 65 years old. I'll just retire. And and uh, I just felt that, but my work with um, that, um, trying to help our families, it didn't feel like it was complete. And, and I was honored when the tribal training certificate partnership notified me and uh, asked me, my wife was doing training with them and they asked if I wanted to do a Zoom administrator of the uh, Zoom meetings and and it was with Indian Child Welfare. And it just, just kind of fulfilled something and made me really um, felt good to do the work again that Noah is so needed and so important and so needs to help our families and and it feels like it is making a difference for with the work that they do and um, finally doing things that people have asked like we're at this conference in Oklahoma this weekend and they asked me to videotape you know some of the speakers including Sandy and I love doing that kind of work and um, so I'm 71 years old and just really um, working more than I did when I was had a full-time job. Well, and also, folks, you need to know that he is one of our um, uh, doted on actors in uh, Indian country, and he's been working on that. Um, I'm just going to I'm just going to put that out there in front of everybody, George. Um, that he's been in some different productions over the last few years. Um, one of his goals and, I guess, dreams, not unlike mine, maybe I should start working on that too, right? <laughs> Back on the page. But um, um, his last, one of his last projects was to be an extra in the upcoming film that'll be released October 20th, um, Killers of the Flower Moon. So um, we encourage all of you to take a take a look at that um, in theaters, please, and see if you can spot George on the screen, uh, the big screen um, out of big old Osage Reservation where it was um, filmed and produced. So how was that experience for you? That was really one of the greatest things that, you know, I've been in different like independent films and did a few plays and done voiceovers. And I always told my wife, I want to be in a major movie just once. It's just, then I would be happy. And I should have said, I want a major speaking part. I want to win an Oscar, but I, but yes. I did get a major movie picture as an extra. So I'm happy with that. And I just, you know, to see that, be part of that film and to know that story of everything that happened to the old stage people, man, it, it's just incredible. But to see how the movie was done and to rub elbows with De Niro and DiCaprio and uh, Lily Gladstone, I think her name mm -hmm. is, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it was really awesome. I can't wait to see it. I know. I'm looking forward to it too. And for those of you who need or want more information, you can go again to. Um, the activities list there. We have that as a part of our hoping that part of our promotion or activities listed for the Truth and Healing Movement. So you can go to elc.org slash truth and healing and, and, and look for more information, including the link to the book if you want to order the book and read it first. It's a great book. Um, so um, I encourage you to look at that too. Well, I have um, maybe one last question um, for us this evening. And um, it's one that um, is always one that I'm thinking about all the time. Um, from a variety of perspectives, but um, what would you, George, as a survivor of Indian boarding schools, encourage the church to know or do regarding Indian boarding schools and the legacy of genocide through that tool? I think we need to recognize that the trauma of that is still here with the ones that have been to boarding school, the trauma that is felt by all our relatives across Turtle Island. Um, just recently, the Native American, Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition was working on 
these issues for many years and they're doing awesome work have discovered another 100 and I can't remember how many more boarding schools that we didn't know about and in Canada and a lot here in the United States too and how there's not much effort as I see it, especially um, the churches to find out where these boarding schools are. More importantly, to find out to find the relatives who are still there. We need to have these relatives go home. They need to be where their families are. And to work with the with the um, survivors somehow because they have so much healing to do. And if there's a way that you could support that, whatever way that I know Vance is very knowledgeable in this area and have you can give directions of how you know we can um, you can do better or the churches can do better to help us heal. Mm -hmm. So many of us that need to do that, and and when you're uh, so many of them that have to come to terms about what happened, not ignore it, to face them, and then the healing, the reconciliation, or whatever needs to be done will happen. It can happen. You need to ask the Indian people what they want mm -hmm. not, not assume we know what needs to be done mm -hmm. very good thank you very much for that I, I agree with that 100% and thank, thankful for that wisdom um, for those of you who um, want to know more about what um, the ELCA has done for, so far um, with Indian boarding schools you can go to elca.org slash Indian boarding schools um, and you'll see some more information there. But one of the things I want to make sure we lift up too, and I know George has got his orange t-shirt ready, um, but September 30th is um, Day of Remembrance for Indian Boarding Schools. So we want to make sure everybody is wearing their orange t-shirts, make sure that um, you take a picture. If you have a social media account, make sure you post it with the hashtags. You can find all that information again on the calendar and um, Caitlin just put it in the chat, the link to the webpage, um, but you can find more information about orange t-shirts in both places and some of the stuff that we're doing. There's even a new litany of worship um, that was written by Dr. Kelly Sherman Conroy um, that you can use at your church um, or any other worship setting. Um, so take a look at all the resources we have there. Um, I think Sandy and George would be happy to also tag to the primer. Uh, the, the Healing Voices Primer that we produced at the Boarding School Healing Coalition um, just before I arrived there, um, but edited a couple of times. And uh, it um, has a lot, the primer has a lot of uh, wonderful information about um, Indian boarding schools generally. So take a look at that. Um, and also, also to educate your congregation about the boarding schools and all the stuff that is um, still going on today. And I'm only just one, and I'm not the spokesperson. I don't want to be the spokesperson and find all the, the survivors that are still there and know that they have a story to tell, to bring these stories up, to do everything you can. I know my uncle, I never did know, went to boarding school. He went to Pipestone, him and my other uncle. And, and I'm still trying to get his story to tell me, you know, some of the things that happened. So. It is a difficult task, but it can be done. Good. That's a good challenge. That's a good challenge. Um, so I just want to make sure that um, um, we, um, we're remembering um, all the things that George has um, reminded us, but also um, to remember to wear orange. Please do that. Nothing else. One yeah. of the things, that, and that, that sounds so maybe friv frivolous, but it has brought over the last, gosh, what, 10 years, so much attention throughout Canada and now in the United States. And so we want to join that effort on September 30th. So um, like George said, please maybe promote this within your congregations and, and encourage your congregations to learn more generally speaking as well. Um, you are welcome to contact my office if you um, need any guidance. I'm happy to help as best I can. Well, George, those were all my questions. Um, is there anything else that um, you think um, you'd like to share with us before we depart this evening? I just wanted to just 
say one last thing that boarding school did have an impact on me. And all, you know, the years, um, development, developmentally that um, we didn't know what we were doing and now we're trying to figure it out. And there's so many of us that, that need to get to that point. And we appreciate everybody listening, everybody being here tonight. And it's awesome. It, it kind of um, um, sees for me to, to know that people really want to hear now. Mm. And so I really am grateful and say, we thank you mm. for all of you for listening. Mm. Yes. Thank you, George. And what I'd like to do um, this evening, if I can say a prayer over you, George, I'd be um, I'd be honored if you'll let me and all of us who are gathered here, if you'll um, join us in blessing George this evening. Unehlana, Creator God, we give you thanks this day for the opportunity to be in this virtual circle with all the folks gathered around George and, and Sandy. We ask you be with them on their continued journey to um, heal people, to help others find the healing that they have so badly in need for all these years. We thanks for their strength. We ask you be with them in their health and their spirit and in their mind and their um, wisdom as they continue to share across the miles all the things that they do. Bring peace to George. Continue to heal him um, as a survivor, but continue to love on him. Um, as you love um, all the rest of us, we know that um, you are always with us. Might we always be mindful of that. As we depart from this place, may we all feel that peace together. Wado, 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 wado. Yeah. Well, thank you, Papa George. Thank you. This was fantastic. And I'm so grateful for um, you're spending time with me and with the rest of us. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in Oklahoma City with you and Unsi. I, I, I know, we're looking forward to it, but it will, it will happen. It will, it will. And I'll be in Minneapolis soon. So I'll let you know, um, like within the next three or four weeks, I'll let you know, maybe we can make uh, some plans to get together again. So yeah. Unsi, know that I hear you back there and that um, I love you too. <laughs> All right, y'all have a great evening and thank you all so much. Again, continue to check out the webpage, elca.org slash indigenous. Um, share that with other folks and we'll see you um, hopefully on Monday when we'll be having some conversations with some descendants of boarding school survivors who have since um, walked on. And so um, we'll hear some stories about their loved ones and about their experience as descendants. So please join us on Monday evening, seven central. All right, folks, have a great evening. Thank you, Papa. Thank you. Bye.